No, I've told you many times, I am not good at telling jokes. I, I'm just not, but I keep trying. I keep trying so that I can get better at it because, you know, a lot of ministers, when they stand up, they like to tell a little funny people. I'm not going to try to do that, but every now and then I hear something that I just think is funny. Like the other day I heard this one where a guy dies and he goes to heaven, he stands before St. Peter, and, and St. Peter is, is kind of giving him a tour of the whole place. And so he goes into this room and he sees uh, this room with all these clocks and, and this, the, they're all going at different speeds. All right, now those of you that are on your phones, you're not gonna get this joke if you're on your phone. So he sees all these clocks with all these different speeds and he asked St. Peter about this and St. Peter said, well, that, that tells us, you know, what kind of sitting life this guy had. If it's moving real fast, then they've sinned a lot. And so he sees this one and it's just going really, really slow. And he said, whose clock is that? And he said, that's Billy Graham's. Then he sees this other clock, which is just painlessly going around. He said, who's that? He said, it's Mother Teresa's clock. And he's curious and he says, I'd like to see my clock. And the guy said, oh, that's easy. We have it over here in the office. We use it as a fan. <laughs> All right. I probably told that wrong because when I heard it, I just guffawed. I just yacked it up. All right, this morning I'm going to do something. I, I like, I've done this before. I like to do series. I like to do things where they're tied together maybe two or three or four weeks. We've done that with Joseph. We've done that with other things. But this morning I'm going to, I'm, I'm digging back a little bit. I, I said this to uh, most of you already that back many years ago, I, I wanted to do a series on the book of Exodus, the book of Exodus, kind of a, a difficult book because it can be a little cryptic and it can be a little yawn, uh, uh, you know, a lot of detail in it. But uh, I got about a third of the way into it. I didn't preach any of it, but in preparation, and so, but I got sidetracked and I didn't continue. So I'm going, I picked it up the other day and going through some notes. I, I found my notes again. I decided to get into it a little bit more and see how far I could go with it. So here we go. It's a study on the book of Exodus. The book of Exodus is the second book in the Bible. And it's really kind of a challenge for me because I've never really taught anything on the book of Exodus, but the more I studied it over the past week, uh, I've been struck by by all the things that happen, and it's an epic book. And so, what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of flesh this out a little bit. Then we're going to read some scripture from the book of Exodus, from the Word of God. And when this starts, the total of numbers. Listen to this. You probably didn't think of this. When when the Exodus starts, the or the book of Exodus. The total number of Israelites is about 70 people. 70 people. I bet you thought it was millions, not at that point. And when it ends, this is when it expands and blows up. There are like two or three million of them. And so what we're going to do is we're going to follow the journey of the way God is leading them, what he's saying to them. And if you're listening, if you have eyes to see, you're going to see all kinds of connections to your own journey, you really will. So many of the things that God needed to show them are things that God needs to show us. And just like God is showing them their way out of where they were and towards where he wanted them to go, God is doing the same thing with you. He's, he's taking you from where you are into a place that he wants you to be. God is leading us. And, and as a church also, not just this individuals, but as a church as well. And the question is, is are we listening? And are we following? Here's something that I noticed right away, right away in the book of Exodus. The very first word in the book of Exodus, in the original language, which is Hebrew, listen to this, 
is the word and. Now, you don't pick this up in the King James or the New King James or, or uh, the NIV or ESV or any of these. You don't pick that up because we're taught in the English language you don't start a sentence with the word and. You, you, just, you just don't do that. But in the original language, in the book of Exodus, it's the very first word. Now, you can see this, too. This isn't just something you've got to go to college or Bible school to find. Uh, there's a, a translation. It's called Young's Literal Translation. And it's available to all of us. And here is what he's saying here is that Exodus is actually a continuation of the book of Genesis. It is. It's, it's like they're tied together. And, and let me give you, just in case you didn't know, uh, the, it's like Moses is assuming, he's the one that wrote these books, we call it the Pentateuch, first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And he, it's like he's assuming that you already, he didn't write this for you, he wrote this for the people, his audience, but God is taking this and using this for you. And he's assuming that you already know when he gets into Exodus, you already know the history of what's gone on in the book of Genesis, just in case you didn't know up here thousands of years later. I'm going to give you like a 45-second summary. At this point, going into Exodus, there was no nation of Israel. Israel did not exist. All there was, there was a guy named Joseph. A guy named Joseph who had a father by the name of Jacob, and Joseph had a bunch of brothers who hated his guts. They didn't like him. They were so jealous of him. And so what they do is they hatch this plan to get rid of Joseph. So they're out in the prairie, the field, the whatever. And what they do is they beat the snot out of this guy. They do his their younger brother. They beat him up. They want him dead. Then they toss him in a pit. And then they kind of, you know, they, they see this slave uh, caravan going by. And so somebody has a better idea. Let's do this. Let's sell him to the slavers who are going to Egypt. We'll never see him again, and we'll make a couple of bucks. So they pull him out of the pit, and they sell him to these slavers. Well, through a series of really, really strange events, we've talked about this before, Joseph is way up, then he's way down. He's way up in a position of great things, then he's in jail for a few years. But he ends up being, listen to this, second in command of all of Egypt. And there's a word for that, I've told it. It's called vizier, vizier, B-I-Z-I-E-R. And, and basically, it's like in, in England, It'd be like prime minister. Your second in Pharaoh was the top gun. He he was he was he was the big guy, but Joseph became second in command of all of Egypt. Now, meanwhile, there's this famine that's going around. Big famine, huge famine. Nobody's ever seen it anything like this. And there's not any food anywhere except in Egypt. And if you want, you can come to Egypt and buy food. And the person you've got to see is, guess who? Joe. You want to buy food? you got to go to Joe because he's got this plan where he's already prepared years in advance because he sees this through a vision, that a dream that it's coming. So he's got this plan. Now, people are coming from all over the place, other countries, other areas, to buy food in Egypt. And guess who comes? Joseph's brothers. They're there. They come, and they have to go to Joseph. Now, a lot of time has gone by. Joseph has been uh, assimilated into the Egyptian culture. He still kept his Hebrew faith, but he, has kept, he, he looks differently. He's got Egyptian clothes on. He probably speaks Egyptian by now. He looks differently. And they don't recognize him. 
but he recognizes them. And over some, Joseph is not holding this grudge. He sees his family, and the Bible teaches us that he cries. They don't cry because they don't know who he is, but he cries. And he's now developing this plan to, uh, to reconcile with them, which is, what a great story this is. And so finally, he reveals this, himself to them through a couple of little, little plans that he has. And these guys are shocked. They think that Joseph is now going to kill him out of spite. But Joseph doesn't. He embraces them. He says he's going to take care of them. And, and he does. And, and it all ends with them getting together. The fa they got the band back together again. They're all together. And there's uh, some epic words that are spoken by Joseph. And I love these. We, we know these. He said to his brothers, what you plan for evil, God planned for good. Basically, he needed to get me here so that I could save your lives. Right? What a, what a wonderful story. And so they... His family comes, his, father's, his father and all of his brothers and his nieces and nephews and their grandkids. The whole family moves to Egypt and they settle in Egypt. And that's how the book of Genesis ends and the book of Exodus starts. So I'm going to read this, Gen or Exodus chapter 1, verse 1. Here we go. These are the names of the sons of Israel who went to Egypt with Jacob, each with his family, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, and Benjamin, Dan, and Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. The descendants of Jacob, here's where we get that number 70. Descendants of Jacob numbered 70 in all. Joseph was already in Egypt. Now Joseph and all of his brothers and all that generation died. It's given us now, it's moving forward here with everything. But the Is Israelites were exceedingly fruitful. They multiplied greatly, increased in numbers, and became so numerous that the land was filled with them that a new king or a new pharaoh to whom Joseph meant nothing came to power in Egypt. Look, he said to his people, the Israelites have come become far too numerous for us. Come, we must deal shrewdly, or another word we could use here is severely with them. Or they will become even more numerous, and if war breaks out, we'll join our they'll join our enemies and fight against us and leave our country. That's the word of God. Let's pray together. Let's do this. Father, I ask you, uh, this this morning that you will bless your word you'll bless your word everything that we read in some way leads or is a type or a symbol of, lead, of, of showing us towards Jesus and this will also but we ask that you give us eyes to see and ears to hear so that we may understand your word this morning in Christ's holy name amen the Egyptians are about to make some big, big changes in the way they're dealing with Israelis. And, and what this does, they've had a pretty good life in Egypt so far because of Pharaoh and Joseph. But now with this new Pharaoh and Joseph is, is gone, um, the new Pharaoh is saying, these guys are becoming far too numerous for us. They're not true Egyptians. And if we go to war with somebody, they may kind of team up with the, our enemies and fight us and defeat us from within. So we need to do something to subdue them. And so this begins a period of, of misery for the Hebrews. And, and, and life is very, very difficult for them. If you think your life is difficult, you ought to read through this. You'll get a whole new perspective. And you'll think, well, my life isn't bad at all. So here's the first thing we learn from the misery of the Israelites. There are three points to this. I'll give them to you as we go along. The first point is the nature of slavery. 
nature of slavery. Here's my first point. Verse 11, read that. Uh, so they put slave masters over them to oppress them <coughs> with forced labor. And they built Pythom and Ramesses as store cities for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the Israelis, the more they multiplied and spread. So the Egyptians came to dread the Israelis, Israelites and work them ruthlessly. Now, I looked up that word ruthlessly. I mean, I, I kind of have an idea of what it is. But the word ruthlessly basically means to crush, to put it under so much oppression that, that you feel like you can't breathe, like, like you're being suffocated. And that's how the, the Israelis were starting to feel. <coughs> they were starting to feel not just depressed, but they were feeling like they were being suffocated. Look at verse 14. They made their lives bitter with harsh labor in brick and mortar and with all kinds of work in the fields. In all their harsh labor, the Egyptians worked them ruthlessly. Now, there's a word, as I was reading this, there's a word that, you know, I don't read, I don't read Hebrew. I can't, I can't do that. I, did, I never took Hebrew in school. But there are so many resources available, not just to me, but to all of us. And as I read this, you know, in kind of this parallel thing from Hebrew to English, there was this word that kept showing up again and again. And that word is avad, or some say evade. But uh, uh, people that will tell you how to pronounce the word couldn't come to any agreement. So it's A V. A-D, Ibad, we'll, we'll say. And it basically means to serve as masters. Now, if you were to go to Young's literal translation again, here is what you would read, just very literally. They made their lives bitter with serving in brick and mortar and with all kinds of serving. In all their serving, they made them serve ruthlessly. I mean, I, you can only read that kind of thing for so long, terribly repetitious. But so what English translators have done is they put in synonyms, words that, 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 that sound differently but mean the same. They, they put in these synonyms to give it more variety, but it takes nothing away from what the scripture is saying. But here's the point. The point is, if we serve anything other than God, it's slavery. It's slavery. It's bitter. It's miserable. And I was talking with a guy this past week, uh, uh, and, and he's not a believer in Christ. But as we were just kind of talking about some things, and I had alluded to uh, slavery and serving other things. He said this, he said, I'm not a slave. I, I, I don't serve God, but, but I don't serve anybody. I don't serve anything. I'm a free agent. I'm my own person. I'm my own man. This doesn't apply to me. And I hadn't come to this place yet in my studies. And I said something else to him. But this is what I would say today. You know, I'd show him from, even from the book of Exodus, that the wisdom of God's word in the book of Exodus would challenge him on this. Step back for a minute. This is what I did. I, I kind of stepped back and zoomed way out so I could look at this book in a different way. And most of us know the basic story of the book of Exodus. God wants to get his people out of there, so he raises up Moses, right? And he goes to Pharaoh and he says basically, let my people go, you know? And we stop right there. It's, you know, it's like the song, let my people go. We don't say everything. We do that a lot with scripture. 
We just say the part of the scripture that's pertinent to what we want to say. And we get this locked in, like that's the only thing it, it says. But the rest of the quote goes, here's, he's saying, here's God's message to you, Pharaoh. Let my people go so they can go and serve and worship me. That's what it says. Okay. I don't know if you've tried to read through the book of Exodus before. Some people, when they want to read the Bible, they, they, you know, they read it in like a year type thing. And, and so that, that's sometimes hard to do because you come to a lot of things that you can stumble over, a lot of, uh, 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 uh. you know, so if, if you can't sleep at night, read those parts, right? That'll put you to sleep. And then the devil, he doesn't want you reading the word. So, you know, so while you're reading, he'll come over and rock your bed like it's a cradle. Next thing you know, he doesn't want you reading God's word. But if you're going to do it on yourself, read parts like, you know, when you, you read part of Exodus, and parts of it are really, really exciting. You got uh the burning bush, the plagues of Egypt, the Passover crossing of the Red Sea. It's all action. Then you get about halfway through, and then God is instructing them in great articulate detail on how to build the temple. Stuff that Tim would love. Now, I planned on saying that even with him sitting over there. I'd say, Tim, you'd love this. Tim would get a big smile on his face. We're tempted to skip parts of the word that are like that. But because they're dry, they're just really, really dry. But as I read through it, I forced myself to read through it. And I realized we can't skip through that. We've got to read these things because in those instructions, in these instructions, God is inviting his people and he's showing his people how to worship him and how to serve him instead of worshiping and serving everything else, right? And we need this. In 2024, we need this because our modern concept of freedom is like this. I am free when I have no master and I can do anything I wanna do. That's freedom. But as I'm reading Exodus, and I'm trying to read it like, not like somebody who loves the word and somebody who wants to be a scholar in the word, but I'm just reading it as just kind of a, a casual layman reader. The Exodus is saying, that's not the way the human heart works. It doesn't work like that. Moses doesn't say, let my people go so they can go and do anything they want to do. What it does say, let my people go so they can go, they can learn and go and serve and worship God. Let me say it like this. You will never, ever, ever be free unless you are amazed by, enamored, ravished by, and down, and bowed down before the beauty of and the glory of God. That's what he made you for. He didn't make you so he could just go and do whatever you want. You can, you can do a lot of stuff. It's fun stuff, exciting stuff, adventuresome, risky things. But until you are just engulfed by God, and there are other things in your life that are taking your attention, they're like God substitutes, you're not really free. You're a slave. The book of Exodus reminds us that we have a strong tendency and we are really, really good at worshiping and serving other things more than God. It's always things like, well, if I have this, I'll be happy. And if I don't have it, I'll be unfulfilled. I'll be miserable. I'll, I, I, won't, I, I won't be complete. I'll be awful to live with. Whatever that thing is, if your heart is in servitude to it, it means you're not free. It's not. It can be anything. 
It can be a bad thing. It can be something like drugs. And I'm not talking about the street variety stuff. I'm not talking about a, a 20 bag of heroin. I'm not talking about methamphetamines or fentanyl. Or even something that's so, that people minimize so much today. You know, uh, weed, marijuana. It can be something over the counter. Something that your doctor has prescribed for you to sleep. You can become addicted to that stuff. If that's what you depend on, to sleep. It can be pornography. It can be that stuff that locks you in. And you got to go to it. It can be food. It can be a food addiction. But it can also be good things, too. These, you know, as I began to think about, that, there are a million of good things you can become addicted to. Really, I, I, I used to, when I was younger, I loved to hunt. I loved to fish. I don't do those things today because, you know, I got so busy, I just didn't have time for them anymore. But so many things. I, I wish some of our teenagers were here this morning. Because it can be things like, uh, you know, you're standing in high school. It can be your friends. It can be sports. Anything that makes your life good or feel good. It can be a million different things. Any things anything that you look at and you say, if I have that, my life is good. And if I don't have it, I feel desperate. I feel incomplete. But here's the point. If anything but God fills that role, okay, you're a slave. You're enslaved to it. And it's not worthy of your worship. And ultimately, that thing will let you down. That's the big thing. That thing will let you down and will end in misery. And the book of Exodus calls us out of that into freedom. Because when God's love becomes your ultimate source of security and significance, then you will be free. You'll be free. Everything else will then fall into its proper place. Everything has a place. But that perspective won't be found because your number one source won't be the one that made you. That's the first thing. The misery of the Israelites teaches us that when we serve anything but God, we are slaves. And God wants something better for you and for me. Here's the second thing. The silence of God. Ooh. The silence of God. Let me continue reading Exodus chapter 1, verse 15. I'm going to read through Exodus 2, verse 3. Listen. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, whose names were Shipra and Pua, when you are helping the Israelite women during childbirth on the delivery stool, if you see that the baby is a boy, kill him. But if it's a girl, let her live. The midwives, however, feared God and did not do what the king of Egypt told them to do. They let the boys live. Then the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and asked them, why have you done this? Why have you let the boys live? And the midwives answered him, the Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women. They are vigorous and strong and give birth before we even arrive. So God was kind to the midwives and the people increased and became even more numerous. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families of their own. Then Pharaoh gave this order to all the people, every Hebrew boy that is born, you must throw into the river, Nile, then let every girl live. I, now a man of the tribe of Levi married a Levite woman, and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. 
When she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. But when she could not hide him any longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and coated it with tar and pitch. Then she placed the child in it, put him among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. Just kind of put yourself in an Israeli shoes for just a minute. Your life has been pretty good. Egypt is your home. You got a business, maybe. Your family's doing well. Kids are going to school, and you got enough food and all that. But, but lately, things are kind of changing up a little bit. Things are shifting in government policy. They've now stripped you of your rights. You've now got to work 12-hour days, seven days a week. And you're going, what's, what's going on? Things can't get any worse. Ah, but they do. And, and the, then you hear this rumor, this, this thing. It, it, it's supposedly coming from Pharaoh that the government has ordered all the Hebrew male king, king, uh, infants to be killed. Well, it's just so barbaric. Who's going to believe that kind of stuff? It's just not going to happen. But as time goes by, it's true. You know families who, whose kids have been thrown in the river and eaten by crocodiles probably, right? This is it. And this sense of terror just spreads through your community. But there's a little glimmer of light, a little glimmer of light. You hear of these two midwives that are going around and they have saved countless infant baby boys. But that just makes the king, the king hears about it. He's just more determined now. So what he does <coughs> is he, he says, listen, if you see somebody out there with a little baby boy just walking along the street, I'm giving you the right to rip that baby out of their arms and take that baby down to the river Nile and throw him in. And if they fight with you, we're going to have soldiers out and they're going to back you up. These kids, have, they, they've got to be killed. It's got a feel to these Hebrews now like the world has been overcome by evil. Like it's been turned upside down. Now, the story kind of narrows here a little bit. There's a family that we read about. Uh, a, a, the, the, the man is a Levite. His wife gets pregnant. She's now, they're pregnant. They're from the tribe of Levi, which, by the way, is the tribe that the priests come from. Priests are the one, ones that stand between God and man, right? And, and maybe, uh, as I read that, I thought, God is so, he's so big and so clever. It's, it's the same family that the Messiah is going to come through, right? And it's the same family, the tribe of Levi, that Moses is going to play a role in one day. So try to put yourself in the shoes of this family now. She gives birth to this perfect little baby boy. She, she hides him for three months. She, it's getting more and more difficult to do that. So what she does is she takes this basket and, and she, she waterproofs it. She puts tar and pitch all around him. She, she does an unthinkable thing. She, she puts her three-month-old infant into that basket and launches him into the river. Right? He's now in the river Nile. And, and you know, and, and again, as I was thinking about this, I, just trying to put myself in their shoes, they've got to be thinking, where is God? Not just in our lives, but in the whole nation, not all of our people, your chosen people. God, where, where are you? This, this arrogant dictator is just doing more and more and more you know, abusive things to us. And, and God isn't even mentioned in all of this, except when we read about how he's blessing these 
these two midwives through their act of bravery. God seems to be completely, totally out of the picture, totally silent. I think one of the ways that Exodus is relevant to us today is because God's silence, think about this, God's silence is a universal experience. You ever felt like God was silent? Anybody? I, I think I have. But, but I have a different understanding of how that goes. If you read the book of Psalms over and over and over again, you, you hear this cry, God, where are you? God, we're dying down here. Why are you asleep? Why do you slumber? Wake up! Why are you so, why are you so absent from the sounds of our groaning? God, where are you? Some, sometimes you can go on the... the, the uh, social media, Facebook or other things. You go online and you read some tragic story. Then you scroll down a little farther. You get readers' comments, and, and a lot of them are not even what I would call believers in the Word of God. People who may, maybe don't even know him. And they're making their comments. One of the most common... Uh, most frequent comments. Where was, where was your God when this happened? Where, where was God when this child died or when this woman was raped? Where, where was God? It's all over the place. Remember back in the day, there was a group called the Fray. Anybody ever heard of the Fray? F R A Y? Ben has. You're not old enough for that, Ben. But yet he does. They, they sang a lot of Christian music. And they, they wrote the words of this song. They direct the words to God. Here's what they said. God, where were you when everything was falling apart? Why'd you have to wait? Where were you? Where were you? And then when you look at the misery of these Israelis, people just like us. It confirms this thing, all, all of us have felt that there are times in life, sometimes long periods of time when it seems like God is out taking a break somewhere. But, but, if we have eyes to see and ears to hear and we know his word, we also learn that it's during those times that God, he's not gone. He's not silent, but God is at work. He's at work behind the scenes, silently using the, the very bad circumstances that seem to be afflicting us for ultimate good. Let, look at verse 4. Let's pick it up there. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. Then Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe. Her attendants were walking along the riverbanks. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her female slave to get it. She opened it, saw the baby. He was crying, and she felt sorry for him. This is one of those Hebrew babies, she said. Then his sister asked Pharaoh's daughter, that's Moses' sister, by the way, Shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? Yes, go, she answered. So the girl went, <laughs> listen to this, and got the baby's mother. She had been nursing him up to that point. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this baby and nurse him for me, and I will pay you. How many, and I will pay you. How many, mo how many moms are paid for feeding their kids? So the woman took the baby and nursed him. And when the child grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. She named him Moses, saying, I drew him out of the water. Think of this. The very schemes of Pharaoh are turned against him. The very things that, that he used to kill all these kids are accomplishing the very opposite of what he intended. Pharaoh said, 
I'm going to kill all the male infants. And, and because he made this law, Pharaoh has this totally unreal, blessed upbringing. First, he was nursed and cared for by his mother, which in that culture was probably three, four years. And because he, she's got him during this time, he's learning. He's, it's the, the Hebrew culture uh, identity from those early years are imprinted on him. He knows Hebrew culture. And then he's brought up and educated in Pharaoh's house, which is all great preparation for the, the task that God has for Moses in the future, right? And here's this decree designed to control and subdue Israel to keep them in their place. And that's the very decree that creates the ideal liberator for Israel. I mean, I'm going to move along here a little bit faster. What does this mean? It means that when God seems the most silent and absent, he isn't. He's working for good. He's working for good in your life right now. Whether you're a teenager or young adult or got a few more miles on you, God is working in the background, even in the worst of tragedies. Sometimes, maybe you don't say these words, but you think, since I can't see any good reason for this, there must not be any good reason. How arrogant. How arrogant. It's faulty logic. How will we believe that God is working deeply? We might ask ourselves, when he seems so silent. But God is working. He always has been. Here's the last point. There's strategy. There's strategy. Strategy of God. Here's how I would describe God's strategy. He seems to always be at work through the most, through the weakest, through the most uh, marginalized people around through the most unlikely people. If you go back in the book of Genesis, here are the, these older, stronger brothers, but God uses the weaker, younger brother, right? He, he, he chose a barren woman to work through. He chose an unlovable woman to work through. He chose an unlovely woman to work through. And throughout the Old Testament, God seems to work with people that don't seem to be worth it, but they're willing to be used. God found Gideon in a hole. Remember that story? He found Joseph in a prison. He found Daniel in a lion's den. He always shows up in the middle of trouble, not in the absence. And when the world sees failure, God sees future. And when you feel unqualified, remember this. God doesn't recruit from the pedestal up, on, up in the peak. He, re, he recruits from the pit. That's our God right there. Even the story that we've just read. Who are the two heroes in the story? These two midwives. Women back in that culture were, were nothing. They were, they, were, they, were, they were like uh, merchandise. They were nothing. Women who had no children, who were, were usually midwives, they were the lowest of the low. They were, at best, useless, cursed by the gods. But God used them, and he made them heroes. Now remember, well, let me ask you this. Do you know the name of the Pharaoh that did all the, these atrocities? Anybody know? I don't. Nobody knows. But we know the names of these two midwives. You know, for 3,000 years, we've known their names. They're heroes. They were nothing. But yet God allows you to, re they're heroes in the faith. Chapter 2, Moses' mother carries out, listen to this. 
carries out this creative act of civil disobedience. Pharaoh orders all these male children to be thrown into the river, which is technically what his mother does, right? Pharaoh didn't say you couldn't put the kid in the basket first. That was brilliant. Then Pharaoh's daughter, non-Israelite, uh, uh, an ethnic outsider, God uses her. I'll tell you what, as I end this, if you feel poor, weak, marginalized, if you feel like you're not in the perfect position to be used by God, know this, just throw yourself into his arms and let him use you. And who would have thought, I mean, as I was growing up in a housing project, back then, project kids in Fulton were known, known as project rats. That's where I lived. God can do anything he wants to do. Anything he wants to do. It also means this, if we want to be godly people, Go out of our way to love on people who don't have any power. Or they don't have any status. Are there people like that around us? I haven't met any quite like that, except down the road a little farther. But love on them. If those are the kinds of people that God shows special care for, then we as, an indivi as individuals and as a church we need to go out of our way to care for them. It goes all the way back to that verse, by our love for each other. Will people know that we are his disciples? Those are the kinds of people that when we love on them, we are the most godly. <laughs> and by the way, it puts us in the path of most of God's blessings too. So that's it. When we read the story of Moses, this is what I, I always write these taglines, I call them, just taglines. But I think sometimes they're, they're the best thing that I can say in a whole message. This is what I wrote. I wrote this last night. When we read the story of Moses, you know what we have to do. We have to let it lead us to the one that Moses points to. Story does, the story sounds familiar. A king makes a law that all the male children should be destroyed. Where have we seen that before? Herod, right? Jesus. King Herod makes a decree that all the male kids should be, should be, uh, destroyed. And yet one special child is rescued. Who's that? Jesus. So instead of being impressed with Moses, let Moses direct you towards Jesus. And all through this book, we're going to see things that point us to Jesus. Reminds us that sometimes, listen, I, I wrote this at like one o'clock in the morning. I'm typing this out. And sometimes my, uh, what, what do they call that? My, my spell check. <laughs> and I, you ever try to do that talk to text on your phone? And you put, you, you're saying, I'll meet you at Palangio's. But it writes down something like, you stink and I never want to see you. You know, something like that. The passage we looked at reminds us that God sometimes seems absent. But let it point you to the most terrifying time in history when God seemed silent and Jesus was on the cross and he cried those words, Lama, Lama, Sabachthani.